the writer of Hebrews introduces us into what's called the Hall of Faith. In this lesson entitled Faith and Righteousness, we're going to talk about what is the end result of faith. And then we're going to go over a brief description of what is faith. There are notes for this lesson. I'll leave a link in the description below and in the comment section. Click that link, get your notes, your Sunday school books, and your Bibles. For the International Standard Sunday School lesson is now in session. Join me. You better. Let's go. Teaching the Word of God in the spirit of excellence. Join Elder Rodney Jones with our Sunday School lesson. Building and equipping the children of God. Grab your Bibles, grab your notes. Get your lessons and get ready. Now let's go. Sunday school is now in session. Sunday school is now in session. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sunday School Lesson. That's taught by Pastor Rodney Jones. I'm the pastor of the New Nation Anointed Ministries Church of God in Christ. And we're located 1700 West 87th Street in the city of Chicago. The zip code is 60620. If this is your first time, do me a favor. Leave me a comment in the comment section below. I'd like to welcome you to Sunday School and thank you for taking the time to view this particular channel. If you have not done so, do me a favor, please hit that thumbs up or that like button. Then click and subscribe to this channel. Make sure you hit the bell notification and all so YouTube will notify you each week. Bing! He just uploaded another lesson. Today we're dealing with faith and righteousness. And we got a whole lot of scriptures that we're going to be reading. We're in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 4a. Then we jump through 7a. Then we go to verses 8. Then verses 17 through 18. Then verses 20 to 23. Then verses 32. Then verses 39 through 40. I'm tired just reading. I feel like I've just done the whole lesson. But this is a great lesson. This is an international Sunday school lesson. This is first Sunday. Happy New Year's to you. We're in the year 2024, and I praise God. In this lesson, we're going to talk about faith. Now, I'm going to let you know that the writer is not really giving us a full definition of what faith is, but he's given us a description of what faith is and the end results of faith. Now, there are notes for this lesson. There are probably about 13 pages. I don't know. But if you're having problems trying to find it, just look right below this video where you see the description. Click that with a description and you'll see a link. Or you can go where I made my comment. In the comment section where you make comments, you'll see my name highlighted. Click there and you will see the link. You'll be able to go to where the notes are. Yes. And so let's get ready to read this lesson and let's see what the writer's got to say. Father, we thank you for this lesson and we praise your holy name in Jesus name. Uh, thank God. Amen. The lesson. Let's go. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Ladies and gentlemen, the first thing I want to put on the floor is this word here. Now, keep in mind, the word is not noun faith. The word is noun, number one, and then faith, number two. So in other words, the writer is not saying noun faith. You got to have that noun faith. No, please, let's stop doing that. That is not what the writer is saying. <laughs> so number one, when I get these notes, uh, the, the, the writer speaks where he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
So the writer speaks about faith and then he shows us what it looks like. He uses different people of old who operated out of faith rather than out of fear. He uses different people who operated out of faith and gave us an example of what took place when they operated out of faith rather than out of fear. And God was always in the picture of each person who chose faith rather than fear. The opposite of faith is fear. The opposite of fear is faith. So this is an example to us that regardless of opposition, faith is greater and always greater than fear. Number two, he continues his conversation or his writings from Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 35 through 39. He says, do not cast away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. You have need of patience so that after you have done his will, you will receive the promise. Now the just, he says, shall live by faith. Then he opens up Hebrews 11 and demonstrates what that faith is from the previous chapter. This is not a, a full definition, but a description of what faith is. Faith is the ground or confidence. It is the assurance or guarantee. Faith is the sure confidence. Faith is the confident assurance of things hoped for. Now he says two things about faith. Number one, he says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. And number two, he says, faith is the evidence. Two key words would be substance and evidence of things. Then he uses the term of things differently. The first one is things not seen. And the second one is things or are things that are hoped for. So faith and hope, they usually work together. Usually the things we hope for, we have faith for. Uh -huh. Then he gives us to know what faith looks like. He gives us to know how one operates in faith. And then he gives us the end result of those that operated in faith. And lastly, he shows us God's reaction in the lives of those who operated in faith. He says, faith is the substance. That word faith means to win over. So if I ask you the definition of faith, the definition of faith is not faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's a description. The word faith itself means to win over, to persuade. Faith means belief or trust with an implication that actions based on that trust may follow. So number one, our faith is not in ourselves, but it is in God, Mark 11 and 2. Number two, our faith is in standing on his word and promises that are given to us. That's Hebrews 11 and 33. And number three, our faith is, um, if I speak to this mountain, it will be removed. <laughs> Matthew 17 and 20. Not decree it. Speak to it. He says faith is the substance. Now that word substance is a unique word because it means to place under. So in general, it's that which underlines the apparent. Or the word substance means reality. Substance means the essence. So what he's saying is that substance is the, or faith I should say, is the assurance. Faith is the guarantee. Faith is the confidence, which means if you have faith for it, faith doesn't say it's going to happen. Faith says it has already happened. How do you know it? Because my faith itself is the actual substance. My faith is the actual assurance guarantee that it has happened although it has not been manifested yet. Are uh, you hearing what I'm saying? And I'll put it like this and move forward because sometimes we wrestle with the word faith. We say, I, I am saved by faith, but then we'll say, I will be healed. Well, that's the same type. I understand that there is a saving faith and there's a healing faith. 
But if we can use that faith that we are saved by faith now, why do we always say I will be healed by faith later? Why can't it be now? And lastly, faith is the evidence. Evidence says you are guilty. In order for them to find you guilty in court, they have to show the evidence. Well, your evidence that you got it is called faith. It is the evidence of things. So faith is the actual evidence of the things we cannot see. This evidence being the proof of what it says, I see it when I don't see it. Our faith is what brings the thing that we hope for into our present. That's what faith does. Verse number two says, for by it, it being faith. Now he's getting ready to talk. The elders right here, they obtain a good report. Now that obtaining of that good report actually is going to come from God. We're going to show you in a minute. The elders or the ancients or even the Hebrew uh, patriarchs or fathers or even those of the age. They obtained. The word obtain means to witness. Or in the Greek, it means were testified of. Or it means, and it means to be well reported of God. Or God gave testimony of their faith. God testified of the faith of the people that we are getting ready to talk about. They were testified of by others as well as by God is what he's saying. For by the faith, uh, uh, the elders, the, those of the age, they obtained a good report. It was in such a way until God, did y'all see the way that fellow slammed down there? Now we go from by faith to through faith. Ah, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed. They were framed. And how were they framed? These words, or the world was framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen, uh, notice how he say that, which were made of things not which do appear. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So I don't confuse it. So here the King James says through faith and not faith. Through faith we understand, which means we perceive to apprehend, to discern, or even to comprehend that the world, uh, which means the age or referring to an age or a time. By faith we believe or we understand that the world that are was framed, framed. The word framed means a putting together. We believe that it was framed by the word of God because God spoke and it was done. Now, there are other books and artifacts and articles and religions and doctrines and people and new age people who are challenging the validity of the Bible and stay away from them. Because somebody gets this idea that the Bible is not for real and it was copied from something else. Really? Okay. The person who told you that, where did they get their information from? And all it is, is to discredit God. So the things that appear with the eye were not made by the things that we can see because God spoke this world into existence. He spoke it and his son, Jesus Christ, performed it. Now he gives us one of our first examples of faith. By faith, keep that word, by. What he did is he offered up unto God a more excellent, more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which, by his faith and by his offering up, he obtained, same thing, witness, that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, 
yet speaketh, although I think we only got part one. So the writer shows three different people who exemplified faith, heirs of righteousness. Abel, Enoch, and Noah. He demonstrates to us the importance of exemplifying faith. God was pleased by their faith of these three men, although I know it's one right here, but we had this lesson prior to, and I chose to leave some of this information in here. God was pleased by the faith of the individuals that we speak of. Number one, four things are mentioned about Abel in dealing with faith. Number one, he offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Number two, he obtained witness that he was righteous. Number four, God testified of his gifts. At three, and number four, by it he being dead yet speaketh. His blood still cries out from the earth, and what he did is still being spoken about. By faith, he offered up a better sacrifice. Now, uh, Abel is a great witness, an example of faith in action. Abel and Cain both offered unto the Lord their substance. But the Lord had respect unto one, but not unto the other, Genesis 4, 4 through 5. They had two different types of work, or they did two different types in the field. Please do not think that God accepted one because of the type of sacrifice. No. God accepts what you give to him from the heart. One gave from the heart joyfully and gave God his best. The other gave God the leftovers, what he chose to give it, and he probably just slapped it up there and said, here, take it. Cain was the tiller of the ground, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. Cain offered unto the Lord the fruit of the ground. That's uh, Genesis 4 and 3. He says, by faith, Abel offered unto. Uh, we do know of an existing, or we do not know, I should say, of an existing law that required them to bring anything. We don't see a law that says they must bring. So some things probably was written that we don't have a knowledge of. All we see is the two of these brothers giving unto the Lord something that they both gave. We see God rejecting one and we see God accepting the other. So scripture does not tell us the type of offering God accepts during that time. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering. Abel brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. So Cain just brought something from the ground, but Abel gave the firstlings and the fat, the lean, the riches. He gave the best and he offered it unto the Lord by faith. And because of that, God accepted his offering but he rejected the brother. Now we go from him to Noah. Noah being warned of God of things, notice what he says, not seen. Faith is the substance of things not seen. I thought that was interesting. Now he was warned, warned. He was warned of God of things not seen. What had they not seen? They never seen rain before. Now he was warned of God and then he moved with respect, with reverence, and with fear. And what he did was he prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Because of the faith of Noah, his house was saved. He is another witness. You will find now, now Noah was the great grandson of Enoch. That's Genesis 5, 22 through 29. So the writer mentions a fourfold blessing due to his faith. By faith, he was warned of God. He believed that it was God speaking to him. By faith, he moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his family. And this same faith he had for the ark condemned the world because they didn't accept it. And by faith, he became heir of this righteousness, which is by faith. And the Bible did say that Noah was righteous in his generation, Genesis 6 and 9. Noah, as did Enoch, he walked with God, Genesis 6 and 9. And Noah did all that God commanded him and built the ark. Noah didn't build this ark 
in water. <laughs> Noah built the ark before something that never happened happened. In other words, it had never flooded. They don't know what rain looked like. And Noah believed that this was God speaking to him. And he began to build this ark through and by faith. And he was rewarded with the simple fact that God saved his entire family, whereby the rest of the world was condemned because they didn't trust God, <laughs> nor his man's servant. So by faith, he was warned. He was warned. Noah was warned that something would happen that had never happened. And he moved with fear, which means reverential fear or even reverence. God told him to make this ark in Genesis, the sixth chapter, verses number 14. And he did exactly what God told him. We jump to them, to his man here, the man of faith. When he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive, for an inheritance, he obeyed. Notice, by faith there is an obedience. By faith there is a moving. Each one by faith performed a task. You don't have faith and sit still. And he went out not knowing whither he was going. Do you not know that that faith, that not knowing, is also connected with not seeing? Remember, faith is the substance of things not seen. So far, each of these uh, people, men or persons or participants of faith moved with something they didn't see. The writer is showing us it's not about what you see. It's about how you move and not about moving in fear, but moving in faith. And God rewards those who move not in fear, but in faith. I'm going to move on. Because I want to touch something, but I'm not. So Abraham is considered as the father of faith in Romans, the fourth chapter. He was called by God to the land of Canaan, which he said would be his in the 12th chapter of Genesis. Actually, that took place in the 11th chapter because the 12th chapter said God had said. That's past tense. So God appeared unto Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he got to Haran. That's Acts 7 and 2. And God told him to leave his country, his kindred, to a land that he will show him. And Abraham left and went towards Canaan. Only God knew where he was going. Abraham went blindly, but he had faith and trusted that God was the one speaking and that he would be rewarded for obeying the voice of God. We're still with this guy, Abraham, but we're in a different situation. By faith, when he was tried, oh my this is the worst time and period in the life of Abraham. When he was tried, he offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises, that's Abraham right there, offered up his only begotten. Now, sometimes that word begotten means dear or loved uh, or unique. It means unique as well. Now remember, and let me read, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now this is the interesting one because God promised Abraham that he would have a child. When God, when Abraham met Sarah in Genesis 11 and 40 or 30, over there, when he married her, she was barren and could not have children. And God approached Abram and told him that to leave his father, his mother, the land, the country, and everybody, and go to a land that he will show him. And then God also made a promise to him that I'm going to give you all of this. And he's going to give it to you and your seed for possession. But at that point, he didn't have no children. And later, uh, Ishmael would be born. But God said, Ishmael is not the one. Then finally, God give him more information and let him know that your wife Sarah is the one that's going to give birth to a child and Sarah and through Sarah, you're going to have a son named Isaac and through Isaac, all nations of the earth is going to be blessed. Then we get to the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis 
And the Bible said that it came to pass that God put Abram to the test and told him, offer up your son. The name Isaac means laughter. Take your laughter and offer him up. Kill him, Moses or Abraham, is what God said. Mm. Now, God approached him as a friend because he says, I pray thee. That's the language of a friend. I pray thee, show me your friendship because Abraham was called a friend of God. Show me that our friendship is more valuable than your laughter, than your blessing. The Bible says Abraham strapped his boy down, grabbed his knife and got ready to cut him up and offer him up. And then the angel spoke out to heaven from heaven and called him and says, now I know that you are going to keep my commandment. And it was in and through Isaac that his seed would be blessed by faith, by trust, by conviction, by belief, by reliance upon when he was tried. The word tried means to make proof of or trial of. The word tried means to be put to the proof or put to the test. Abraham was put to the test and the word only begotten means only born because he was only born, the only born of Sarah. It also means unique. He was a unique child because he says that in Isaac is who your seed is going to be called. Thy seed, ladies and gentlemen, I need you to know that that seed is Jesus. Mm -hmm. By faith, by faith, Isaac. So Isaac is alive. <laughs> and by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Not things that has already been existed, but concerning things to come. I think that's interesting. So interesting how the writer used the phrase things to come with things not seen. Uh, Isaac was the son of Abraham who God had tested to offer him up. But at the last minute, God says, you don't have to do it because God doesn't accept human sacrifice. Isaac was the father of Esau and Jacob, who were twins born to him by Rebekah, Genesis, the 25th chapter. And Isaac was up in age and he could barely see. He called his son Esau to him so that he can eat and bless him. Esau went into the field to go get the victuals and kill it and bring it to his father. And that's when his mother brought Jacob in there, put some goat or the kid uh, uh, which was hairy because that's how Esau was, put it on him when the father who could barely see got him close. He said, you smell like Esau, but you sound like Jacob. But he blessed him anyhow. So by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. He did this through trust and reliance. He believed that what he had said was of God, and it was because it was for Jacob to get that blessing. Don't ever think that God plays a game where he would trick me to bless you uh, and you not, and, and if the blessing is not for you. In other words, if this blessing was not for Jacob, Jacob never would have gotten it, but Esau would have gotten it. So the blessing was for Jacob, but God had to also show them that I'm not subject to custom. Custom is the oldest child, but God is not subject to custom. Verses number 21 says, by faith, Jacob, here we go. When he was dying, uh, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worship. Now he says, leaning upon his staff. I need you to know that staff, ladies and gentlemen, would be his headboard or his, his head board or whatever they might call it because his eyes were dim and he was laying up on the headboard and he was using it as a prop or as a post and that's when he blessed them. So Jacob had 12 sons and one daughter, Dinah, by two wives and two handmaids, Genesis 49. Ten of his sons would be the tribes and two were not. Reuben and his brother were, or Simeon, were replaced. Uh, Reuben was unstable as water, 
I don't remember why or what happened with Simeon. He was about 147 years old when he was getting ready to die. And he was in Egypt in the 37th chapter of the book of Genesis. And about the time that he knew that he was dying, he made Joseph promise not to bury him in Egypt. And later, Joseph heard that his father was sick. In the 48th chapter, he brought his sons there and uh, he did what we call a cross blessing. This is the second time where the older one did not receive the blessing of the older because God is not subject to our custom. So by faith, when he was a dying, he blessed both the sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, leaning on the staff. He did this by faith. Let's look at what else. And by faith, Joseph right here, when he, when he died or when he was dying, he made mention of departing of the children of Israel and gave commandments concerning his bones. Now, this one is interesting because Joseph, as we say, was the son of Jacob, who he loved more than the rest of his brothers, Genesis 37 and 3. His brothers sold him to merchants and the merchants sold him into Egypt for slavery, Genesis 37 and 28. And Joseph had actually been sent there by God to hold up a posterity so when Israel run out of food, they'll have a place to stay. But regardless of what happened to him, he never lost focus on God. And he knew that God was going to come back to get his people, and he made them swear that they would not leave his bones there in Egypt. By faith, when he died, he made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. He called his brothers together in Genesis, the 50th chapter, and told them that God was going to visit them and God was going to deliver them. And he said, when God does this, take my bones with you. Just like Jacob said, don't leave me here. He says they gave uh, concerning, uh, gave mention concerning his bones. The word mention means to exercise memory. That is to recollect, to rehearse, or even to remember. So he brought to mind what was going to take place. And then he charged them to take his bones with him. Neither him or his father wanted to stay there. They both knew that they was going to have to leave. Now we jump to the time when they would be re uh, received, getting ready to be delivered out of Egypt by faith. All of this has taken place by faith. Faith, another word, remember, is trust. It is belief. It is confidence. It is to rely, so on and so forth. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. Now, this particular faith is not of Moses. This faith is of his parents. And they hid him because they saw that he was a proper child. Another way of saying that was he was a goodly child. Or another way of saying that was he was a handsome child. Now, they were not afraid of the commandment of the king. So what they did was they hid him for protection. They didn't hide him because they were fearful of the king. They saw him when he was born, that he was a beautiful, a doll, a little baby. He was very handsome. And they kept him because the king says, kill all male children that are born of the Hebrew women and throw them in the Nile River. But the scripture says, when, a, when Moses was born, by faith, his parents hid him for three months. And when they could hide him no more, they built a bulrush for him, put him in the Nile River, and they watched him. And that baby floated all the way over there to the house of Pharaoh. And Moses ended up rising up, being the deliverer for Israel. That was no accident. That was faith. And God rewarded. He says, and what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, or some say Barak. Samson, 
Jephna, and David, Samuel, and the prophets. He's a judge, 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 judge. He was a king. And he was the last of the judges. And then he shifts to the prophets. Let's see what we can get into in this particular one. So the person of faith in here is not about Moses, but it is about his parents. So the writers add, he adds more names to the hall of fame. The first one he deals with is Gideon. Gideon became a judge because Israel sinned. Each one of these judges is mentioned because Israel sinned against God. And when they sinned against God, God turned them over to the opposing force or to the enemies. And he kept them there for a few years. And then each time Israel would cry, then God will raise up a judge. And the purpose of the judge is to cause them to repent and to bring them back to God. The first judge he mentions, although it is out of order, it's not in chronological order. And I believe one of the reasons why is because Gideon did more work. He was a stronger judge than Barak or Barak. I believe that is Barak. So God's, uh, when Israel did sin against God, he turned them over to the hands of the Midianites. And the Midianites were so cruel until they would eat up all of the land. They would bring their cattle there. Their cattle would eat up everything as well. They would not leave anything for the Israelites' livestock. And so Israel ended up living in caves up in the mountains. And the scripture says that the angel of the Lord appeared. Uh, first, God sent the prophet and told them what? Because Israel cried unto the Lord, God sent the prophet. He explained to them why they was in, being punished. And then God sent an angel to Gideon who was threshing wheat in the wine press. You don't thresh wheat in the wine press. You make wine in the wine press. But the angel found him who was hiding and called him a my, mighty man of valor. And he told him to get an army because God is going to deliver them into his hand. He had an army of 32,000 people, but God told him that's too much because Israel is going to be, begin to brag. And God broke his army from 32,000 down to 300. And he was successful in the defeating the Midianites. Then we get to Barak. Now, I, I don't too much care for Barak because I think he was slight of a coward. And I will tell you why. He's mentioned after Gideon, but he was recorded before Gideon. He's in the fourth chapter. Israel had sinned and God allowed the oppressor to come. This guy named Sisera had what was called 900 iron chariots. 900 iron chariots chariots and he oppressed Israel for 20 years then the people cried out unto the Lord and Deborah came who was a prophetess and a judge she came and she told Barak she says the Lord says for you to get 10,000 warriors and go and win and become a warrior here's the part that I don't like because Barak says unto her I will do it only if you go with me. You are out of order, but I'm going to move on because that's my little discrepancy. Scripture said that she decided to go with them and they were successful. She told him when to leave, but she also told him that it was going to, a woman was going to get the, 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 the props for this particular war. So Barak and Deborah went to war and he led 10,000 warriors and God gave him into his hand and he was victorious in battle. And scripture says not one single person survived. So he was successful. Then we go to Samson, who was also a judge. Now, the Bible said that Samson would be a very unique man because Samson's father, Manoah, and his mother, his mother couldn't have children. But once again, 
that doesn't stop God. God blessed her. The angel told her, you was going to have a son. You were, he was going to be born of you. He says, what you got to do is don't give him no wine. You can't drink no wine. You can't drink strong drink. You're not to put a razor to his head. And he said that he will begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistine. And this man killed a thousand people with the jawbone of an ass in Judges 15 and 16. But when I go all the way down to the 16th chapter and the 30th verse, he goes in between two columns and tell God to avenge me of my eyes and let me die with them. And the Bible said that God did it and more people died in his death than in his life. So he was sent there to judge the Philistines. Jephthah was a Gileadite. <laughs> he was a mighty man of war. You'll find him in Judges the 11th chapter. He was the son of a harlot. That's interesting. Because he was the son of a harlot, his brothers excommunicated. They put him out. He moved to another location. The enemy came in, attacked that area. So his family sent for him, told him, we need you to come back and lead us into war. He did it. He was victorious and he succeeded in it because he did this in faith. David was a man of faith because he fought against this guy named Goliath. This is before David became king. Through faith, David delivered and destroyed Goliath, that big old giant man. Scripture lets us know that Goliath was about nine feet, at least nine inches. And if David was four or five feet, that man was at least four feet higher, taller than David. But David says, I'm coming in the name of the Lord. And David destroyed him. Then lastly, we look at the Samuel. Samuel, uh, he was the shifting of the judges of Israel into the kings. Samuel was the one, the Bible said that not one of his words fell to the ground. He was a young man when God called him. He was so powerful in God until he anointed both Saul, the first king, and David, who ended up being the greatest king. And Samuel was a very powerful man. Speaker speaks about the prophets. Every prophet moved and prophesied according to the will, the grace, and the word of God. And they all prophesied through faith because they believed that this was God speaking through them to them and to others. Some of the prophets even would be Isaiah. It would be Jeremiah. It would be Ezekiel. It would be Daniel and all the rest of these prophets. Then let's look at lastly what the scripture says here. He says, and these all, now watch this, they all obtained good report. They got good witness from God because of their faith, but they did not receive the promise. Now what, what she said, God having provided some better thing for us that they, which is the ones we're talking about, without us should not be made perfect or complete. I believe these promises, ladies and gentlemen, is salvation through Christ. Yeah. They never saw Christ in their day, in their time. All of them earned a good reputation. They gained divine approval through God. They didn't receive the fulfillment of what was promised. Because what was promised was eternal life. What was promised was salvation. Go back to when God promised Abraham. In you shall all families of the earth be blessed. He says, in your seed, Isaac, or through your seed, Isaac, all families of the earth is going to be called. Those are promises. And that calling, that seed is Jesus Christ. Let's look at Luke 10 and 23. It says, and he turned him unto his disciples, meaning Jesus, and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. 
Hebrews 11 and 13 says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They knew that this home was not theirs and that they were temporary dwelling and that there is a promise of an eternal life. There was a better city and a better house. You'll find that in the same chapter. And 1 Peter 1 and 12 says, Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a long, long, long passages of scripture. And I know sometimes I go a little bit in depth or give a little bit more information. That's for the purpose of everybody can be able to pull from something. You might not need some of this information, but I understand my audience. And I understand that there are many people who only need certain bits of information. And therefore, I try to provide enough information for everyone to feed from. I want to thank you for uh, studying with me in the year 2023. I want to thank you for your financial support, your letters, your text messages, your inboxes, your emails. Thank you for even the checks that have been in the mail or cards that have been in the mail. They have blessed my heart. I constantly read them. It's hard for me to throw them out. They, my, all my office is full, and I just read them and just read them and read them. I read your emails. You've been blessing me. You can continue to support me if you can. Just understand that whatever you give goes back into the kingdom of God. Remember to do something. Like, subscribe to this channel. Leave me some comments below. Make sure you share this lesson. Remember my model. Teaching the word of God in the spirit of excellence. Peace. The Lord said the same. The creek don't rise. The Lord delays coming. If I don't oversleep, I see you Sunday, 8 o'clock for our live. Peace. Please subscribe to my granddad's channel. Thank you.